Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Why No One Plays. Okay, so just a quick announcement. I apologize for how I sound in this video, it's just that allergy season is at its worst right now and uh, I'm very congested so I apologize in advance, but I hope you enjoyed the video nonetheless. Today's episode is a little different this time. For the most part, all of the characters I've talked about in this series have been unpopular from release at the time of making their respective installments. This character in particular actually had a rather strong presence during the early days of Genshin. At one point, there was even discussion over whether or not he was the strongest damage dealer in the game, at least relative to the investment required. But as the game progressed and new units were added to the roster, people gradually weaned off of using him in favor of other, more powerful DPS characters, and the public's declining opinion on him soon followed. So today, I wanted to discuss what happened to Razor and why people have stopped playing him. For those who joined the game later on in its lifespan, Razor may come off as your garden variety electro DPS unit. And well he is, but his reputation was vastly different early on than it is now. Unless you were lucky enough to land either Diluc or Kuching with your early pulls, Razor would more often than not be the first damage dealer you run into, and he seems pretty cool. Story-wise, you encounter him when you complete the questline to unlock Andreas, and he embodies the trope of a strong and capable fighter with very few words to say. His rugged and disheveled appearance contrasted with Mondstadt's prim and proper characters like the Knights of Favonius, and when you got to experience his playstyle for yourself, it also felt a lot different. Game designers frequently tend to replicate a character's personality into their playstyle as a means to establish a connection between the player and their character. For example, a gentle and good-natured type like Barbara will likely have a very fluttery, soothing, and supportive motif to her abilities and attacks. Someone with a strict and by-the-book attitude will likely have rigid but swift and decisive forms such as Jean. In the same way, Razor was fostered by a pack of wolves and has likely assimilated their instincts and behavior. In other words, his playstyle is very aggressive, wild, assaulting his target hard and fast, further expressed by his where wolf spirit attacks in tandem with him. He's very violent and feral in this regard. Of the three examples I just listed, which one do you think speaks to the average gamer the most? Razor, right? Especially with an edgy sounding name like that. Funnily enough, as you get to know him, you realize he's nothing more than an adorable asocial dork and is rather timid when it comes to any matters involving people. Whether you're an anime fan or not, Gapmoe is a term used in reference to characters to describe when said character behaves in a way completely contradictory to what their usual habits, personality, and appearance dictates. One of the reasons why Kuching is so popular is that despite her strong sense of independence from gods, very much like a closet weeb, she secretly collects memorabilia of Zhongli. Subversion of expectations is what adds depth to characters whether in video games or stories, and that contributed a lot to Razor's initial appeal. Mod's deck characters were colorful and varied, but they were all, at the end of the day, kind of linear. This was a breath of fresh air. The other part of his early popularity was directly correlated to the fact that there weren't many practical options for a main damage dealer at the time. Your choices were pretty much Kuching, Diluc, maybe Ningguang, and Razor, give or take. Because of the handling issues with Catalyst, along with Jiu being the worst element in the game prior to Zhongli and Albedo, Ningguang gained little to no attention. Kuching and Diluc were superior to Razor, but their rarity and by extension large paywall made acquiring either of them quite challenging, especially for free to place. Through process of elimination, that left us with just Razor. His early widespread usage wasn't solely a result of the lack of choice, however. Considering the fact that both Diluc and Kuching's constellations were ostensibly unattainable, and a viable 5 star weapon not having been released yet for the latter, Razor was far easier to gear up in terms of weaponry and constellations. If we're splitting hairs, Kuching is better than Razor, but that's assuming you're crazy enough to pursue multiple copies of her on the standard banner where there's no guarantee of her no matter how many off banners you pull. So in the end, many players were using Razor out of necessity. Damage dealers as you know are interchangeable since the existing content doesn't mandate specific characters or combinations of units to be deployed, barring edge cases. And when I say mandate, I mean like you explicitly need, say, animal units for this dungeon, any other element does 90% less damage type thing. We do have things like the lectors and whatnot, but virtually everything we have at the moment is brute forceable to an extent. Alongside that, for the first few months or so, there was a lot of propaganda circulating the web regarding the scarcity of resources in the game. Chests don't respawn, resin gates how much you can do per day, you don't get a lot of experience or more of farming things normally, and there are few, if any, repeatable quests that aren't commissions. Fast forward to a year and a half later, I think many of us have gotten to a point where we're too lazy to use the resin we have already, but at the time, a lot of players bought into the sentiment that they should be as parsimonious as they can. And acting on that, players immediately saw Razor as a low-cost, high-return option for damage. As far as overall numbers were concerned, there was no one who came remotely close to his total damage output relative to the amount of investment required. 
You can make do with Prototype Archaic, a 4-star weapon that was forgeable in-game and load up on percent attack artifacts before Chris Dice became all the rage. He was the most cost-effective damage dealer until the advent of new 5-star DPSers like Xiao and Ganyu. On that note, within the purview of main damage dealers, there are three factors that determine their efficiency. Burst, Consistency, and Synergy. With how Genshin's combat was designed, burst damage takes precedence over consistent damage by way of elemental reactions, unless future systems changes are implemented to where each elemental application lasts a set number of time, during which you can apply as many reactions pertaining to that element as much as humanly possible. It's generally better if the character is able to dish out a single powerful blow as opposed to death by a thousand cuts. Hu Tao is the best representative of this, as she's all about nailing targets with one really heavy blast of flame. Of course, you need to be able to easily access that burst damage. There are a good number of characters with extremely high damage ceilings, yet they struggle to consistently reach that high point due to either circumstance or insufficient wherewithal. Xiao is one such example. At Max Constellation, he's arguably the single most powerful damage dealer if we go by individuals, but to achieve C6, you have to be prepared to spend upwards of $1,000 on average. The other is Eula, whose Glacial Illumination outclasses any other 5-star in sheer power, but that's only under the very difficult if not impossible condition of landing 30 separate attacks within 7 seconds. Not an easy feat by any means. Synergy is also of great import. Damage dealers work best when supported by a well-constructed team, one that can ideally boost their damage and uptime so as not to only augment their DPS, but to ensure they can use it in the most efficient way possible. Even though I said earlier that one strong hit is preferable to many small hits, Ayaka and Ganyu are top-tier DPS users on account of Freeze being the definitive best reaction in the game, so while they technically follow quantity of attacks, they can do so by virtue of their element. Anything that allows them to induce chain freeze makes them catastrophically more dangerous. Razor's performance in all three departments is middling at best. His primary method of applying damage is through rapid attacks, which means he effectively loses access to burst combos and quick swap as either option can only afford to have him fielded as the active member for no more than 5 seconds or so. He doesn't have a very easy way to one-shot hordes of enemies because you can only do that with elemental bursts, and his is a steroid type buff, not a burst of damage. This does come with the pleasant side effect of being very consistent. Thanks to his elemental skill and passive talents, he has no trouble maintaining his provided he's always attacking stuff. That's part of why he was the unit of choice in version 1.0. Coaching Diluc and Razor were all consistent damage dealers in that they didn't put much focus on quickswap chaining. That of course changed with the advent of Child, Ganyu, and Hu Tao, causing quickswap to become exponentially more effective than any alternative. In addition to this, physical damage is curtailed way more than elemental since enemies are more likely to have high physical resistance than elemental. I made a video detailing the challenges behind physical damage a while back, but one thing I forgot to mention is that physical damage falls off much faster since enemy durability scales more in that regard than the other. That's also what contributed to Razor's early success. Enemies had little physical endurance to speak of compared to now where a lot of them do, although that can be mitigated with Superconduct. On the subject of Superconduct, physical damage units are more restricted when it comes to team building as they're heavily dependent on a Cryo and Electro unit to perform at a reasonable level. Thankfully, Racer meets one part of the equation already, he simply needs a cry unit to fill the rest. And there are plenty to choose from, however, that just boils down to using either Rosaria or Diona because if they possess Ganyu, Ayaka, or Eula, they'll probably use them as their main damage dealer, not Racer. Furthermore, lack of elemental burst-oriented damage and his physical damage nature causes many top-level support characters to be inefficient if not potentially unusable on him. The five best supports we have right now are Bennett, Shincho, Kazuha, Shogun, and Zhongli. Bennett can only be used with Razor if you don't unlock his final constellation, and most people don't, but losing out on that 15% pyro damage bonus matters a lot more than you think. Xingqiu is completely worthless on Razor, since his entire shtick is to catalyze a one-man hydro reactor, and physical damage does not interface with hydro at all. Kazuha is also useless on him, as his bonus elemental damage and elemental mastery is dead in the water in regards to enhancing physical damage. Shogun's introduction has orchestrated quick swap burst rotation compositions as the most effective approach to combat in this game by leaps and bounds. Razor's elemental burst doesn't do much damage. That and having her on his team would be redundant since Razor is already Electro. What's ironic is that Eula and Shogun work marvelously together not only because the latter completes the necessary requirements for Superconduct, but Shogun's burst amplification is better the higher your base damage is, and we just went over how Eula is as the highest in the game. That leaves us with just Zhongli. His Jade Shield reduces nearby elemental and physical resistance, so he's the only tier 0 support who can help out Razor, but that's really it. 
In this game, synergy is the number one metric to determine a unit's longevity, how future-proof they are as new units are released. The reason Bennett, Xiangling, and Xingqiu have maintained their status as the trinity of 4-star supports is due to the fact that they work well with just about anyone, and will continue to so long as they don't get replaced by someone who can do the same things they do but more efficiently or powerfully. The inverse is also true. A main DPS unit's viability hinges on how receptive they are to new supports and combinations. If they aren't compatible with this new top tier unit, that means everyone receives an indirect buff except them, which causes them to lag behind the rest of the cast. It's not their individual strength, not entirely anyway. It's how well they mingle with everyone else. That's the basis of how Genshin's character system functions. Razor is one of the few units in Genshin who doesn't synergize with any major support character. Not only is Hoyle trying to emphasize elemental damage over physical, but the way Razor's kit was designed just so happens to be incredibly team unfriendly. He's a very independent character, that was part of his appeal early on. He didn't really require supports or a tailored party to function properly, and that worked back then, it doesn't anymore. There is almost never an instance where you want to stay on one party member for more than 5 to 8 seconds at a time. Even a persistent attacker like Ganyu fires off only 3 or 4 charge level 2 arrows before switching around. Razor needs to be out for a very long time to really get going. There is also one major problem that has nothing to do with him but affects him all the same. Lack of proper physical support is severely hindering his ability to stay relevant against the momentum of elemental burst damage cops. Since it's very clear he's not going to get much mileage from elemental supports, he needs to draw from physical support. Except, there isn't a whole lot of that. This is mostly exclusive to Razor, as Yula's case is a bit different in this regard. Her numbers are so ridiculously overinflated to compensate for having less options to boost her damage externally, and Glacial Illumination happens to allow her to at least utilize Shogun to the fullest. That and she has a personal weapon, a really dang good personal weapon at that. Razor on the other hand was balanced to have more or less the same numbers as regular elemental units, which means he's slightly better than them up until those elemental units start scaling more. Speaking of scaling, something completely absent in his kit is a physical damage booster. Lightning Fangs doesn't boost his auto attack damage the way Noel's big ass Geosword does, it simply causes follow up electro damage. Technically, you could equate the attack speed bonus to increased auto attack damage, but he's still much slower than a sword or a spear user. A quality of life change in this regard would be if the follow up electro damage scaled off of his physical damage bonus. That would give him the same kind of internal power as Eula, since he's not getting it anywhere else. Physical damage scales linearly, while elemental damage scales multiplicatively because there's nothing that allows you to amplify physical damage beyond superconduct. What this essentially means is that Racer is by all accounts fantastic for beginner and mid-game players who don't have a lot of units, weapons, constellations and such. That's partly the reason why the community didn't recognize Xingqiu and Bennett as the 5 stars without actually being 5 stars that they are until several months after Genshin's release. They take a while to get going, Razer doesn't. Does this mean he can't be a worthwhile unit to main long term? No, of course not. You can still use him to complete all of the game's existing content, and many people have. As long as you're aware that by choosing Razor as your main, you don't have a lot of ways to upgrade him in terms of supports and stuff. That and he has a very straightforward playstyle which can work for or against you depending on the situation. He sort of reminds me of Sword Art Online where everyone is a melee DPS and there's no magic or range weaponry. There's only so much you can do on Razor, a limitation you don't really encounter on any of the big name 5 stars. Though there is one thing that could potentially bring him back into the meta. Tier 0 units share a fatal weakness in that they're almost reliant on other units to access their full potential, whereas Razor does not. Quick swaps are also vulnerable to momentum disruption. Any opponent who can drain energy with their attacks, such as the Primordial Vishaps, can cancel out your combos, forcing you to wait for your cooldowns to come off. If this sort of mechanic were to grow in frequency, it could serve as a counter to parties that rely on elemental bursts for the bulk of their damage, much like how Rifthounds nerf shields by damaging you through them. We don't have very many big consistent damage dealers in this game besides Ganyu and Ayaka, so that's one thing going for him. Any instance where you need a singular unit out on the field for extended periods of time is where he thrives. There's just not very many of those right now. Anyways, what do you think about Razor? Do you think he still has a lot of potential, or is he just another victim to power creep and will never get that chance? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments. For now, if you enjoyed the video, it would be awesome if you could leave a like and subscribe. Consider following me on Twitter, joining my Discord server, and checking out my other Why No One Plays episodes after this one. Until next time though, thanks so much for watching. Apologies again if I sounded really bad in this video, but I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.